pleased to take your seats and in a short while we're going to read a psalm. But there are many different types of preaching. There's textual preaching, you know, where we take a text and we expound it and look at it and try to understand the meaning. And then there's topical preaching, where we'll take a topic and we'll just talk about that topic. But then there's burden preaching, when God puts a message on your heart so strongly that you just know it's a message for somebody. And this is what this message I'm going to share this morning is. And I don't know who it's for. It might be for somebody here. It might not be. It might have no relevance to anybody here whatsoever. It might have relevance for somebody you know. That you think, I know somebody who's going through this. This is a message for them. It may have relevance for somebody who listens to it on our website in weeks, months, or even years to come, that they will listen to it and God will use it to help them in their situation. So all I know is that God has put a burden on my heart to speak this message this morning, and that's what I'm going to do. And the title of the message is this, The Power of Walking Away. Now, if I was to ask you this question this morning, how would you answer it? And the question is this. Have you ever made any wrong choices in your life? I know the answer just by your response straight away. Have there been times in your life when you looked back with hindsight and said to yourself, I would make a different choice if those set of circumstances were before me now? I'm sure all of us, if not the majority of people who listen to this message, would conclude that absolutely. In life there have been times we've made good choices. In life there have been times when we've made bad choices. And with every choice in life there is intended consequences, those we planned. Sometimes we make our plans and we work out these are the intended consequences. And we'll do a list of the good things and the bad things and then make a choice based on as much information as we can obtain. Other times there will be unintended consequences. Things we didn't plan, things we didn't anticipate that just happen anyway. But we'll all agree that with every choice there's always a degree of consequences. Those we plan and those we did not plan. I shared the other night that as our daughter recently finished her A-level work, we said to her, we'll just buy you a little present, what do you want? And she chose a computer game, which is called Detroit Becomes Human. And as I sat there watching her play it, because she's now got a bit of time on her hands as she just waits for her results, as I sat there watching her play it, I found it absolutely fascinating, because it was just like a, a film You'll have a kind of a sequence of action, and then it will suddenly come where the characters are faced with choices. And quite often, they don't have a lot of time to make those choices. They'll have only a few seconds to make these choices, and whatever they choose will unlock a different path for these characters. And it's quite fascinating that when you make the choice and you end up with the end result of this game... If you actually play it again and make different choices, the end is different. There's lots of different endings. Some are good endings, some are bad endings, some are absolutely tragic. I won't go into too much details, but it's a very, very clever game where the choices the people make in this game or the choices the controller of the avatar makes can have so many different endings. I think we we'll all agree that life in general is about choices. And even a life lived by faith is about choices. And the life of faith has two paths. And that is the life of wisdom, the wise way to live, or the life of foolishness, a path that is destructive on so many levels, depending upon the choices we make. Now, if the Bible portrayed its characters as men and women who only ever made perfect choices, all of us would doubt the sincerity of it, wouldn't we? 
But if we looked at the men and women of the Bible, and what we saw was a perfect life. Every temptation they met, they passed it with flying colours. Every time they were confused, they made the right decision. Every time they had a choice between obeying God or disobeying God, they made the right decision. They lived an absolutely perfect, faultless life. Wouldn't we be think that's not true to reality? That's not how humans are. But what we see in the pages of the Bible are actually the people who walk across its pages. They did good things, they made many mistakes, and they often made wrong choices. And that's why one of the most interesting characters in the Bible is David, the shepherd boy who slew a giant and became a king, who stood before the giant Goliath fearlessly. Yet later on in his life, when a foreign king nearly captured him, he was so afraid he pretended to be insane to get away. He was a man who could be, in equal measures, very brave and very fearless. He was a man who could be very wise and very foolish very faithful and very faithless, and so on. And I encourage you to read his story in full because it is both insightful and also disturbing in some ways because he received some tremendous blessings for the choices he made, but he also experienced some horrendous and unnecessary suffering for other choices that he made. And again, we see the life of somebody which is something we can equate to in our own experience. Now, I'm going to read Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I had led a blameless life. Now, I'm not going to go into all the Hebrew this morning. When he's talking about a blameless life there, he's not talking about a faultless life. As I say, a life of always making the right choices. He's actually talking about, by a blameless life, that everything he did before God, he owned up to it. The right choices, the wrong choices... He said, God, I'm in your hands. I've messed up here. I'm in your hands. I've done the right thing. And that's why he says in the next um, verse, I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and mind. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. But I lead a blameless life, Redeem me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground. In the great assembly, I will praise the Lord. There's two other verses I want to read from different parts of the Bible. And the second is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, which says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. The second or the third verse I'm going to read is 1 Corinthians 7.15. But if the unbeliever leaves, well, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. In 1994, I'd only been the pastor of two rural churches for a few months, probably less than that. I was sitting in the immense garden, and it was a rural village in Northamptonshire. And I was enjoying the sight of the horses in the field. We had this lovely field at the back, and you could see the horses there. Um, You could hear the cows and the sheep and the noise the cattle make in the farm in the the distance. And it was quite a peaceful evening. The sun was just setting, and I was just sitting there in the garden, just enjoying the peace and the tranquility when all of a sudden there was this furious banging and knocking at the man's door. So suddenly my peace was disturbed. And I went to the door and this woman was standing there. Her makeup was all smeared, her mascara was all running down her face. She had tears on her face as she had bruises all over her face. And she said, Can I come in and speak to you, please? 
She said, I really need somebody to help me. So I said, of course you can. So we went into the manse and she was absolutely hysterical. So I made her a uh, hot drink and um, waited for until she was calm enough to be able to speak and tell me what had happened. And she answered, she said, it's my husband. He's drunk again and we had a, an argument. He's left me and gone to stay in a local hotel. I looked at her face and I said, did he do this to you? And she answered, yes, he did. Making an assumption, I then asked her, I said, would you like me to call the police? No, she said meekly, I want you to go and beg him to come back for me. To cut what was a very long story in the shortest time possible, so it makes sense this morning. I spoke to her for over an hour about her situation, and then I drove her home. Now, I make it a policy never to counsel a drunk person, so there's no way I was going to go around to the husband when he was drunk. I've done that before when you speak to people, and it's a waste of time. You can speak to them for two or three hours. The wisdom of Solomon, you see them the next morning, they don't remember a word of what you've said. So always wait until they've got a clear mind and then, um, you know, speak to them. So the next morning I went to see her husband at the hotel he was staying in. And as soon as I knocked at the door, I was met with a hostile response. I won't use the language he used, but suffice to say, using insulting terms and expletives about his wife when he realised that I was there on her behalf. He said to me, he said, I'll only come back if she turns up here on her knees begging for my forgiveness. He then slammed the door shut in my face. So I drove around to his wife's house and I told her what he said and she answered. She said, I suppose I have no other choice then. I said, what do you mean? She said, and confessed then, she said a similar incident happened about six months ago and she'd gone to a local priest. And the local priest had put the burden on her that she had to go and try and make the marriage right with her husband. And he gave her this big study about the responsibilities of marriage and so forth. She said, I suppose you're going to say the same thing. Now, as I say, as the minister, I don't believe it's my role to ever tell anybody what to do. To say, this is what you must do, do this, don't do that. That's not a minister's role. I see a minister's role as sometimes helping people to understand the choices and options available before them in the light of God's word. And I did that to this lady. I said, well, these are the options before you. I said, there's um, many different options. I said, you can try to make the marriage work and do what he requests. That's an option. It's your choice if you want to do that. I said, you can refuse what he requests and still try to make the marriage work. Or I said, you can tell him it's over and just walk away. That is entirely your choice. She looked shocked. She said, I'm not a churchgoer, she said, but I went to Sunday school as a child and consider myself a Christian. Christian. She said, would God let me do that? And I read to her that verse from Corinthians. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. And she said to me, she said, I've never really considered that an option. I said, well, these are your choices. I said, it has to be your choice what you want to do. And basically she said, I'm too confused to make a decision. What would you do in my circumstance? Now, sometimes I wouldn't answer that question. I would say it has to be your choice. But on this particular occasion, I did. I said, what I would do if I was you, I would tell him it's over. I would say, if he turns up at your door, call the police. If he knocks at your door, call the police. If he telephones you, do not enter into dialogue with him. Just say it's over and hang up the phone. I had that conversation with her. The next day I tried to follow up on this lady and went around to her house and the neighbour said that she had packed a bag the evening before and left, only saying that she had gone to Scotland to stay with her sister. 
Now, I never heard from this woman again until about three weeks ago. I got to the blue. I received an email from her. And she asked if she could speak to me on the telephone. So I gave her my number and she called me. She told me what had happened after the night she left. She said that she moved to Scotland and she filed for a divorce. And she said he kept telephoning me. I took your advice. I said to him, it's over. Put the phone down. He would keep telephoning me several times a day, harassing me, persistent. She said, all I did was took your advice. It's over. Put the phone down. She said, gradually he started to call less and less. I filed for divorce. He accepted it and we got divorced. She said, after the divorce, I met an American man at a local church. She said, we got married and we moved to Chicago. She said, we started a business. It now employs 25 people and has a multi-million dollar turnover each year. She has three children, two sons and a daughter, and she said they're expecting a grandchild soon. And she was back in Scotland visiting her sister, and she said that she became curious as to what had happened to her former husband, and also to me, so she went to Google. She discovered that her former husband is currently in prison for attempted murder of his second wife, that he almost beat her to death with a hammer. She said that she felt so guilty, she went and found the victim of the second wife. And they've offered her a job in America and their church runs a women's refuge and all stuff like this. And they're trying to help this woman. And they're actually trying to sort out the visa now. She's telephoned me to thank me for telling her to walk away. She said it possibly saved as well as changed my life. She said, I did not realise that was an option for me until it was said. And I realised I am a fool, I am stupid if I stay and continue in this situation. I need to have the power to walk away. If it's true of even the most sacred relationship in the Bible, which the Bible talks about marriage, that there are circumstances when it is wiser to walk away, that is actually true in every area of life. Proverbs says, do not speak to a fool, for he will scorn the wisdom of your words. As Christians, some of us sometimes feel hopelessly trapped in certain situations. It could be church relationships, some ministers go through it, some congregations. We can be trapped in situations where we wrongly think the Lord wants us to be endlessly patient and tolerant of the sins of others against us. We're wrongly taught that it's wrong to protect ourselves and believe that it's sinful to leave any sort of circumstance or even relationship. For some reason, we understand the misconception that we would not be good Christians if we do not stick out every situation and continue tolerating just about anything another person says or does. But actually, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that Christians are supposed to be endlessly patient with everybody. Some people love repeating the old saying, patience is a virtue, as if it was an exact biblical quote. And the implication is that we should endure every circumstance being endlessly patient. Patience is listed as the gift of the Holy Spirit in the Bible and considered a trait of a righteous person. But when taken out of context, it has a completely different meaning than what is presented in Scripture. Whatever patience is spoken of in the Bible, it most often refers to not losing our faith in God when we're going through difficult times. That's where the focus is. Keep looking to God, just like David. I keep looking to you. I'm going to extract myself from the assembly of the foolish and the assembly of the wicked, he said. I will have the power to walk away, but I will keep looking at you. That is what it means when patience is spoken of in the Bible. It means not losing our faith in God when we're going through difficult times. It means being patient and waiting for God to rescue us from our trials and persevering 
but also at times having the power to walk away. It does not mean being patient, waiting for others to always change their ways or their behaviour. It's a total misrepresentation of the word of God. Biblical patience never refers to being patient with wickedness or so forth. The Bible does not tell us to continue in relationship with people who damage us. This is personal to myself and Meldy in some senses. I'm not going to say any names or or stuff like that, but um, we had a circumstance recently where people we'd been friends with for well over 15 years all of a sudden one day Melody's defriended off of Facebook then I'm defriended off of Facebook then Joshua defriended off no explanation just suddenly defriended 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 now the temptation would be on the telephone what have we done have we done something to upset you we hadn't actually seen them for months if we had done something to upset them or surely they would have the courtesy to telephone us and say well look you know this is what's happened can we talk it through and apparently through other people what we discovered it was was that Meldy had had her photo taken at a family gathering with a person these people had fallen out with so because they'd fallen out with that person unbeknown to us Meldy had had a photo taken with that person that caused offence with them When relationships are like that, we prayed about it, we discussed it, we said we need to have the power to walk away. We don't want such people in our lives. If we see them, if we come across them, we'll be polite, we'll be courteous. But we will never, ever again entertain the same sort of relationship and friendship with such a person. Because we do not want such people in our lives in our close circumference, and so forth. And so therefore, we discussed and we prayed, our destiny is not tied to those who walk out of our lives. It's tied to those who God brings into it. Sometimes for a season, sometimes for a long time. And we could look back at what happened, and we could look back at that friendship and now feel bitter or resentful, but we made a decision. We said we're going to thank God for everything, the friendship with those people while it lasted taught us. For the good things, the tough times, we thank God for it. But now they've walked away, we're going to let them go. Let them walk, let them go. From our point, it's over. We have no bitterness, no anger, we have peace, we have grace. But even were they to telephone us and say, actually, would you like to come round? We'd love to have fellowship with you. We'd say, no, thank you. I say, bless you, we love you, we wish you well, but actually the whole nature of our relationship has now changed. I close with this because this is something that Jesus did teach, what I'm saying this morning. He said, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, you say and have nothing to do with them. Jesus also told his disciples, he said, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. I close with this. One of my favourite scriptures is Matthew 7, 6 which is Jesus himself speaking to us. He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Some people will take our love for them and use it against us. But the Lord instructs us not to give our best to those who don't appreciate it and will only turn of us instead of giving us equal respect and love in return so whoever this message is for whether it be for somebody here whether you think it's for somebody you know whether it is for somebody who may listen to this on our church website i encourage you to have the power to walk 
away under certain circumstances. When a situation becomes absolutely intolerable, have the courage and the power to walk away. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the principles of your word teach us wise and foolish ways to live. I think of that lady, Lord. The choices she made on that night possibly saved, but totally changed her life. Who knows how many years of misery and suffering she would have endured had she made the choice to stay. But Lord, your word gave her permission to have the power to walk away. She made that choice. Now her life is full of your blessings. She's married to a man she loves and respects. She's part of a large church fellowship in in, in Chicago, actively volunteering and working in the Christian women's refuge that church has founded and supports. She now runs a successful business that employs many people. Lord, we started this message by thinking of the power of choice and both the intended and unintended consequences. Help us realise this power, Lord. We have this power of free will as your people to be able to choose. As we study the principles of your word, Lord, the values by which we seek to live as Christians, may you grant us wisdom and knowledge that we can choose good paths, fruitful paths, paths that bring life and blessing to us and others around us. And if we're walking down paths that damage and destroy and are destructive to us, May we have the power to walk away. May we have the courage to start down new paths. May you lead us and guide us into paths of righteousness, into paths of blessing, into green pastures, and by rivers of living water. In the name of Christ, amen.